Water. It's one of the basic necessities of life. Much of human history has been dictated by the flow of water. Early man migrated from watering hole to watering hole, staying only as long as they had enough water to drink and animals to hunt. As people learned to farm the land, they settled down and water became even more important. Later, societies learned to control the water through irrigation, allowing agriculture on a massive scale, giving rise to great civilizations. The dynasties of ancient Egypt were built on the framework of simple basins and sluices along the Nile. The Roman system of aqueducts supported one of the most powerful empires the world has ever known. Here in Willacy County, Texas, the nearest river is over 35 miles away, yet getting water seems as easy as turning on the faucet. Hello, I'm Dave Osborne, CEO of Valley Telephone Cooperative. In the next few episodes, we'll be exploring the industries and technologies that drive and support our local economies. Today, we'll be taking an in-depth look at Willacy County and the Delta Lake Irrigation System. It was here in the early 20th century that the farmers, businessmen, and community leaders gathered together and created was at that time the largest irrigation system in the world, bringing a thriving farming economy and change to the face of South Texas. Theirs is a story of hard work, perseverance, and ingenuity that exemplifies the spirit of the men and women of our communities. On the southern tip of Texas, along the border with Mexico, lies the Rio Grande Valley. Well known for its citrus industry, the Rio Grande Valley is the state's most important region for vegetable production. It leads in acres of cotton, grain sorghum, and sugar cane. The area is vital to the Texas agriculture economy, but this wasn't always the case. Glenn Harding is a local author who has written two books on the history of Willacy County. Historians have recorded that in the early days, uh, this Willacy County, this South Texas area, was described as various and sundry things, a wild horse desert, a vast grassland, and mesquite moths and oak moths. This was all brush and cactus and arid, and was only good to run cattle. In the early 1900s, the area remained largely unsettled. The only notable community was Brownsville, across the river from Matamoros, and the only way to reach it was to sail out of Corpus Christi or take a 42-hour stagecoach ride out of Alice. In 1904, the St. Louis, Brownsville, and Mexico Railroad was completed, connecting the Rio Grande Valley to the rest of civilization and beginning something special. A short line railroad was built from Robstown to Brownsville. It was uh, finished in 1904. It needed a place to water the steam engine and supply wood to the engine every so many hundred miles. One of those points was at a place later called Raymondville. And so a water well was drilled there for a, a reliable water supply and wood was cut there along the railroad track and stacked there and more could be gathered just nearby to power the engine. Wherever the railroad went, people soon followed and Willacy County was no exception. And these people, mostly from the north, noticed something different about the climate in South Texas. Instead of having a one season growing period in the northern states that because it was snowy and icy and freezing other five or six months out of the year, down in the magic Rio Grande Valley it didn't freeze, hopefully, and uh, you, would have, you would have a summer growing season and a winter 
vegetable growing season, there are some vegetable crops that lend themselves to growing in a cooler climate. And so those crops can be grown and harvested and started in the winter months. About the same time, the results of a joint federal and state environmental study were announced. Test and analysis made by the federal and the state government experts proved that the soil of Willacy County was the best in the world for the cultivation of citrus. The black Victoria sandy loam was perfect for the growth of citrus trees and the economy of the water usage. Like many men of the time, W.A. Harding knew a golden opportunity when he saw one and he wasn't about to pass it up. My grandfather, W.A. Harding, he married my grandmother in Minnesota and they sold her inheritance of a part of the family farm and they, they came down here in 1913 with my 15-year-old father, R.E. Harding. He was tired of living in a place where you couldn't work or couldn't farm five months out of the year. And he was a very ambitious man and very hardworking. And he wanted to come to a place where you could farm 12 months out of the year. And when he discovered this and came here, he, he did work 12 months out of the year. As irresistible as such conditions were for farmers, they were even more so for land developers. Eager to make their fortunes, they formed land companies, bought up land for as little as 25 cents an acre, and successfully marketed and sold hundreds of thousands of acres of inhospitable brush to unsuspecting Midwesterners for hundreds of dollars an acre. Neil Galloway is a director of Delta Lake Irrigation. With out exception all over the valley. Every one of the areas that really took off and went off was why some Yankee trying to line his pockets, but you know, at the expense of the guys that he sold to. My grandfather was one of the suckers. <laughs> and and uh, one of the guys that promoted him as a victim was his own son, who was a land salesman for the land company. And uh, that's how my family came here. They landed in Westlaco in January of 1920, when Westlaco had just been divided off as a little town a year before. And as a result, been here ever since. Many fortunes were won and lost buying and selling land. Mr. W.A. Harding, never a man to rest on his laurels, decided to try his hand in the land game. In search of legal advice, he met a man by the name of Samuel Lamar Gill. Judge Gill trained as a lawyer at that period and was able to give my grandfather legal advice. And so they, they went together with the, a land company. They bought tracts of brush land. One of the first places they bought was 22,000 acres in the Stillman area which is east of Lyford. The Harding Gill Land Company was formed in 1916. They did much to develop the Raymondville and surrounding areas, establishing the communities of Hargill, La Sarah, which were named after their wives, Laura and Sarah, Rollo, named after Harding's only son, Willamar, Santa Margarita, and Santa Monica. My grandfather bought land down here at $400 an acre in the brush and they would give some guy $25 an acre and they would go out and stake it off say now when you clear this off and you've taken the stumps out to six inches below the dirt we'll give you $25 you can have the posts and you can have the wood that you cut and save but the cash is $25, and we'll inspect it. And that was one way that it was done. Buy brush land, 20,000 acres of brush land at a time, and hire crews from Mexico to come up here and uh, live in the brush in tents and clear brush by the acre with talachis and machetes and 
grubbing hose. People have come from Mexico, from here, anywhere, they didn't care. As long as I had a sharp axe and a will to make money and willingness, they'd come out and they'd set their family up in the middle of it and go to work from can to can't until they had that one done and then they'd sign on for another. It was a working man's world and land speculators worked as hard as anyone. They'd do almost anything to make a sale. One well-known story tells of a land company bringing prospective buyers to Galveston and putting them on a train in the dead of night so they couldn't see all the brush. They'd arrive in the land company's entertainment house, enjoy some cigars and cocktails, and go to sleep. In the morning, they'd awaken to a beautiful valley landscape. You can almost believe any story that you hear because every one of those tactics were tried, used, and perfected. That's, that's exactly right. They, they developed this idea and this land promotion and advertising to citizens in the in north of here, in the mid, Middle West, and they gave them a free 10-day vacation to come to the valley. And by that time, they had a hotel built at Delta Lake in the Delta Clubhouse. And they would stay there and entertain them and drive them around and show them the brush land that had been cleared and the citrus trees that had been planted and were starting to grow. There's the remains of one of those places right up here on the highway. I know that that was the Harding and Gill headquarters for entertaining people that came where they sold off this land. That's not the only one. There was, there was, there was one in almost every community. There's, there's one that still exists over here on what used to be called Philagonia Road, just west of Monte Alto, two miles, that was built by the Henson brothers in 1928. And uh, that was that absolutely that's what that was used for. This one wasn't that big, but this one over there was a big home that was designed for the person that was living in the home to have house guests of maybe maybe six to ten people, which they brought in in a two car caravan to come down here to try to show them land and sell them land in the valley. And they would try to sell them the land that they owned that was in the area right there. Ingman Gardens very successfully did the same thing. The Harding and Gill money it went big. Stewart Place is another one of those places. Uh, there's, they're all over the valley. John Sherry, the Benson Brothers, all of those people had these places. Yeah. And as a result, yeah, they partied, wined them, dined them, and, and, and took their money. The 1920s were very profitable for land developers in Willisee County. When we return, we'll see how these men found a new way to maximize the value of their property through irrigation. Willisee County in the 1920s was the domain of land promoters. Word spread that an irrigation system was to be constructed, and that news meant now land selling cheap would soon be worth 20 or 30 times as much. They advertised, gave away free 10-day excursions to the valley, and sold, sold, sold. And uh, cleared it, and sold it, and they, they were getting prepared for an irrigation system that, that was being thought about and organized as early as 1919. The, the water system in the valley was always the tool of promoters because they knew that irrigation was a mode of fulfilling potential for their land that they were out there acquiring and everything else it would make this a much more profitable area for people who were living here and trying to build a town and business and accumulate some form of wealth. And so 
uh, these irrigation districts were starting up. Those on the river with, with uh, riparian water rights developed faster. We had no basic right to river water because we were beyond the 18 mile riparian right line. I didn't, I had never heard of that. Well, in the old Spanish land titles, on all rivers, where it were by Spain, Mexico, subsequently, and Texas at the time, you had a water right granted by the fact that you were adjacent to the river for an area 18 miles out. That's why all the grants were... All those little slices of pie that went 18 miles, and some of them were a mile wide, some of them were half a mile wide, and everything, but they went out 18 miles because that was a grant of water right. The Willisie County area was remote from the Rio Grande River. It had no border on the flow of the water, no claim to the water or use of the water. So they had no riparian water rights, which is your right to use the water and for domestic and livestock and irrigation. If you don't use them, why they cut them off? So if you got an asset, like a water right, because you bought the piece of property with a water right, and it gets chopped off, you've lost it. Then you can grant it out. And so there was a big scramble for legislative rights for water along in the 1900s, right in that area, that frame period. And they would go to the state and get a permit for diversion of so much water out of the Rio Grande River or in other areas, they would do the same thing on other rivers out in the state. And the Rio Grande River was almost over prorated by 1910. In an effort to provide water to the county, many irrigation companies formed, but none were successful. Some of those efforts, in fact, nearly all of them were private private efforts. And they'd go out and sink all their money into the uh, right of way and the construction of a canal that was not efficient and was not real good. What they did was they got taxed on their improvements. And some of those private companies went bankrupt, so they evolved from private efforts into public efforts like Delta Lake Irrigation District to avoid being taxed by the county and the state and anybody so that they could work and put their all their money into the improvement. Creating a public irrigation district wasn't as simple as just signing a few papers. Three problems needed to be solved. First, they needed water rights. Second, they needed to design a way to get that water to the county. Finally, they needed money to pay for it all. The solution to the first problem was simple. But they did not buy the water rights per se. They went to the state and petitioned for them and they were granted. They ended up having to settle for secondary rights. In other words, surplus water only. They were claiming the water that was lost into the Gulf of Mexico during high, the two flood stages of the Rio Grande River. Well, that's a poor way to sell an irrigation district if you're not on the river. Excess water was better than no water, and so the people of Willacy County moved forward with plans for their new public irrigation district. There were two primary designs. The first was a system that was entirely gravity flow. There was a dream way back there, and whoever it was was pretty bright. But they dreamt of putting in a gravity canal from the Rio Grande River across the rush land from above Roma to here, to oh, Delta Lake. In the original plans, there was to be a dam built in the Mariscal Canyon 
in Brewster County. And that was factored in. And then they were going to build a gravity canal from that dam to the valley in Aroma and then on to the valley and it'll go cross country and be contained in canals. But that, that deal didn't materialize. I can remember in my economics class how we discussed it and said it was a marvelous idea and it should be passed. And very shortly later, why it failed because it cost $26 million. The plan that was approved was drastically different. In 1925, plans were started to irrigate 200,000 acres of land in Willacy County. With floodwaters from the Rio Grande River, it would be comprised of the old Union Irrigation District in Willacy County that would distribute water pumped from the river at times of flood from a pump house and they designed it in Mercedes up through a, a giant canal to the reservoir at Delta Lake, then throughout the canals and laterals. Included in the plans for the irrigation system was going to be a, a concrete main canal coming from Mercedes, concrete lateral canals, and concrete pipes to the fields. The water was to be delivered at the highest point in the field so the farmer could run his water by gravity to his crop. The irrigation belt of the land would wind in a circuitous route around the irrigation district. To say that pumping water from the river at Mercedes and sending it up 28 miles to Delta Lake was ambitious would be a severe understatement. It would still be a costly feat by today's standards. In the 1920s, the cost would be $7.5 million. In order to move forward with the idea, the district would need to be funded, and that meant creating a new tax district. They had to have the people here vote it in to become a water district and to vote taxes. And so in this community here, there's one or two still around, old water tanks and silos, where the faction that was promoting the water district went out and built homes and connected them with water, with water pipe, and they had these storage tanks, and they built little bitty room, little bitty two room houses, and they moved people into them and gave them a deed with a huge mortgage so that they could vote for establishment of a water district. They established a little town of Haralo, which became Monte Alto, at La Sara, the same way, to establish people to vote for the water district. The pro-irrigation faction prevailed, and the Texas legislature approved the formation of the Willacy County Water Control and Improvement District Number 1 granting permission to divert 260,000 acre-feet of flood water and issuing a $7.5 million loan. That meant that each member of the district would be responsible for paying $60 per acre. This did not go over smoothly. Then, then there was a large argument about, uh, I, I don't want to be in the irrigation district. I can't afford the $60 indebtedness to pay off the seven and a half million dollars, my share of that, so I, I can just barely afford to buy land at thirty-five dollars an acre, but um, I want in, but not into the irrigation district. And so a lot of the farmers in the south part of the county decided to uh, remain outside of the the district, and there was some consternation about this, but the, finally a meeting that they held uh, to discuss this problem in the Raymondville High School Auditorium was amicably closed when there was agreement, okay, you don't have to all go in. Just those of you that want to be included in the district will be included. It was settled. All the details were in place and an election was held with votes coming in 20 to 1 in favor of bonding the district for $7.5 million. It was heralded as the dawn of Willacy County's new era. 
the largest engineering project ever attempted in the valley, building the largest irrigation system in the world. Then on October 29, 1929, the bottom fell out of the stock market and the United States plunged into the Great Depression. Farmers in the proposed irrigation district needed the water for their crops but they couldn't afford the cost of their property, much less pay their part of the seven and a half million dollars needed to bring that water to their homes. Even men like W.A. Harding were soon bankrupt. It was a dark time for Willisie County and for the nation. But these people had seen hard days before and they weren't about to quit now. Join us next time as we continue their journey. For our community's newsletter, I'm Dave Osborne. Special thanks to Glenn Hardy, who provided many of the historical photos used in this episode. These and hundreds more are available in his two books, Willisie County History, The Early Years, and Rails to the Rio.